Yeah, that's all. Pardon? Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't looking. <laughs> Possibility are most urgent, 
You call to us from our sacred stories, for God, Christ, Spirit, create, challenge, comfort. Guide us, we pray, on an adventure of hope, and help us see with your eyes the ways which lead to beloved community, where Christ Jesus is at the center. Amen. The opening hymn is Abide by Me. It is obviously just instrumental. calls on us to lose our life in order to save it, to take up our cross and follow in the ways of justice and peace. Like the disciples before us, we are often amazed and overwhelmed by this command. We close our ears to such challenge and our hearts to such risk. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Reading from James, verses 1 through 12. Now many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with the greatest strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them embarrassed, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are locked so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small mountain, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set in place by a small fire. The tongue is the fire. The tongue is a place among our members as a, as a world of inequity. It saves the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. 
For every species of beast and bird, a reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it be blessed the Lord and Father, and with it be cursed those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same open both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives? Or a grapevine figs? No more can the salt water yield fresh. So ends this morning's reading. May God add a blessing of understanding to these words. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my strength and my redeemer. The power of words, that's what James is all about, the power of that littlest member of the tongue. In Bible study, Mary said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. She said, who ever came up with that? That is so not true. James agrees. Words are powerful, meaningful. They can rally us, and they can lead us to defeat. Beneath the rule of men entirely great, the pen is mightier than the sword. Behold the archer's enchanter's wand. Itself is nothing but taking sorcery from the master hand to paralyze the Caesars and to strike the loud earth breathless, take away the sword. States can be saved without it. The pen is mightier than the sword. That is a famous quote from statesman and writer Edward Gore Lytton, and it's on the Library of Congress, one of the walls of the Thomas Jefferson building. We've all heard that before. We're all well aware of the power of words, both written and spoken. Yet, once we reach adulthood, we're less aware, we don't think so much about gossip. We don't think about how it can affect others and how it affects ourselves. When I was little, my sister and I, we used to have a regular babysitter that we'd go for. We had lived there for years between school and when my mother would get home from work. And in many ways, we were like cousins to her kids, and it was a neighborhood full of children that went from house to house. And we were all treated about the same. And we all got into trouble pretty much together as kids well. And that included the discovery of foul language. And I remember one day there was a bunch of us kids who we were standing in her kitchen and hallway. And someone said something, and I don't remember what it was exactly, but Marty, our babysitter, her eyes just got huge. She was shocked. Everything in her demeanor completely changed. And she was not happy with any of us when she said, do you want me to wash your mouth out with soap? What? I had never heard that expression before. And it really didn't make any sense to me. As I've been sort of thinking about that story, I realized that it must have been one of the older kids that she was talking to because I wasn't afraid that she was going to come at me with a bar of soap. I was just really perplexed. I couldn't understand why anyone would choose to wash somebody else's mouth out with soap. Would it change us? Improve us? It was lost on me. After the crisis had sort of simmered down, a couple of the other um, younger children and I went into the bathroom and we were like tasting the soap, like trying to get an idea of what, of what any of this meant. And it still didn't make any sense to me because I remember so clearly thinking, words come from my head, not from my mouth. And I think, based on today's reading, I think James would say that words are a product of our hearts. I'm excited today because we're back in James. You may remember that we heard from James a couple of weeks ago. Let everyone be quick to 
writes, slow to speak and slow to anger. Slow to speak because the tongue is a mighty, powerful tool. The letter of James, I think, may just be my new favorite book in the Bible. I feel, perhaps, that we don't give James the credit he deserves, and maybe he gets a little short shrift. Martin Luther didn't think much of James. He called this letter an epistle of straw, because James prioritizes right action. Our words matter, our actions matter, and it's very much a matter. Martin Luther believes that we are saved by faith alone, not actions. Through my inescapable modern lens, I think that maybe Martin Luther was sort of missing the forest for the trees. I don't think James means that we are saved through our actions. I think he simply means that we are, as people of faith, our faith must infuse our words and our deeds. James writes, faith, faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. It is not good enough to praise God on Sunday and to gossip about our sisters and brothers in Christ on Monday. It's not good enough to say we have faith and to not take care of the needy, the orphan, and the widow. The letter of James is associated with James, who was Jesus' brother. He was the head of the church of Jerusalem. And scholars believe that the initial content of this letter came from a homily he gave right before his martyrdom. The content was then edited and expanded upon and distributed as a circular letter probably in the 80s and 90s. In our weekly Bible study, Nancy says, I can hear older brother Jesus in James's voice. Moral fortitude. James is unyielding in his expectations of us. Don't be a hypocrite. And there's not a lot of wiggle room in James. And as humans, we love good old room. We want peace, but we march to war behind the cross of empire. And we have a saying, we say that God is love, and that God loves everyone. Yet, we have a history of, it, of excluding people from our congregations based on race, gender, ability. And James calls us out. He holds us to a high standard, a standard that perhaps is more aspirational than attainable, for most of us, that is. Last week, we had a really lovely visit with some friends of ours from Portland. And they are people who I believe may actually have achieved James's high standard. They are uh, very faithful, very active members of the Catholic community. They, in their younger years, lived in community, separate communities, and um, would literally drive around the streets of Boston taking in homeless people for the night. They couldn't make it into another shelter. Very risky, very love-based. Eric and Anne. Years ago, Eric explained how to put a stop to gossip. And he said, well, when you hear people start talking negatively about someone, all you do is you walk up and say, oh, are you talking about Mary? Isn't she great? Doesn't she make, well, I don't know, a great apple pie? You say something positive, and you remind the people that they're talking about a fellow child of God, just like us. He says it immediately puts a stop to the negativity. People will become a bit baffled, and then a bit abashed. It's a nicer solution, I think, than washing someone's mouth out with soap. Words are powerful. They can heal. In a recent conversation that I had with Joanne, she's been working as a substitute teacher. She was talking about how she loves to work with the kids. She said that some kids just need a little bit of affirmation, a little bit of encouragement and support. That is love. She says, you can see how positively 
quickly they respond. Those kind words, they contain God's love. You can do it. I believe in you. And good job. Well done. In the letter of James, it can seem as if he's very down on the tongue. He goes a little further than if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. He says, no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of poison. Well, that can make a person not want to talk. But perhaps he just means that you have to start with the heart. You get the heart space right and the tongue will follow. If you simply try to control the tongue, say by forcing yourself in silence, it doesn't change your heart space. It doesn't move you into a more compassionate way of being. Silence, in this case, is avoidance. And once that avoiding silence is broken, the tongue returns to its wayward path. And the adage, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say it at all, that can be avoidance too. We really need to speak. Our words are powerful. They need to be heard. Do you remember silence equals death? The rally cry of the AIDS awareness and visibility movement in the 80s? Abusers require silence of their victims. They scare their victims into devastating silence. Bullies make speaking out against them so challenging and unpleasant that people around them find it easier to simply not engage. Our voices matter. Silence can fester, and it creates its own kind of deadly poison. Aren't we, after all, required to do justice and love mercy? And we can't do that in silence or in isolation. James is speaking to early communities who were following Jesus. They were Jewish Christian communities, small communities who, as biblical commentator Casey Sigmund writes, were hoping to distinguish themselves from the world by how they lived. The writer of James is trying to encourage a way of being in the world that is different from the values of the wider culture, a way that is quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And in that, James is so relevant to us today. Here we are, a small Christian community, trying to live into the way of God. We're trying to follow the path of Jesus, the path of radical love and acceptance. It's quite different from the general norm of our American and industrial societies. Out in the world, People, creatures, and the natural world itself are used as commodities. They are a means to a very questionable ends, voiceless, silent. They are holy in this world, only insofar as they have monetary value, and they are discarded as their value depreciates. So here we are, a small Christian community walking against the current of our culture. And it's very hard to shift gears from the cold, hard world to loving community, moving out of that silence of survival. Here, our voices matter. Our actions matter. And together, we create a blessed relief from the status quo. I've been thinking a lot about our congregational meeting today. And it's not just because I'm obsessive, which I am. I hope, I hope you will all go. Getting together in conversation, one that is quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, is one very important way that we as a faith community live into the gospel. Sometimes, we need to speak difficult truths. Sometimes what we say, no matter how careful we are, will hurt someone. But it's better to speak imperfectly through love 
than to let poison fester in silence. Say your peace and trust your community to hold your words and feelings with care. Amen.
As you go out this week, remember to breathe deeply, pause frequently, and love with an extravagance given by God. Amen.